Next, a story by Aaron Doran about a football game that keeps catastrophically, cataclysmically going wrong. What can go wrong? So much more. Are you ready for so much football? Man, I was going to say that first, but I guess it's just time for kickoff, folks. So, let's go back in time to October 7th, 1916. On that day, Georgia Tech hosted Cumberland University for what some would call a game of football. <laughs> Cumberland University, a small school based in Lebanon, Tennessee, scored a perfectly reasonable for the time zero points. Back in, those, now back in those days, seeing games with scores of 0 to 0, 3 to 0, 14 to 7, it's, it's totally common. Totally common score. Now let's consider their opponent, Georgia Tech. They were pretty much the best team in football in the nation. For all intents and purposes, they were unbeatable. At the time of this game, Georgia Tech was somewhere in the middle of a four-year winning streak. Four years, didn't lose a game. That's incredible. So, you figure, of course Georgia Tech is gonna win this game. But what you don't figure is that they're gonna win with a score of 222 <laughs> points. <laughs> Which, yes. As one source put it, it was the worst blowout since the asteroid versus the dinosaurs. <laughs> this, is like the first half of every sports movie where the underdog is getting clobbered, but instead of finding their fighting spirit and rallying for a dramatic comeback in the second half, they just get beat up more. <laughs> Though there is more to this story than just a notable box score. There is incompetence, extortion, revenge, and a ridiculous amount of points. So, I think. Uh, so let's. So let's strike up the band and sing the song of the many weird and awful things that happened in this game. The tone was set early on during the coin toss to determine who starts with the ball. When the team captains did their customary handshake, Georgia Tech's captain did that classic alpha move of a crushing handshake. When asked by the Cumberland captain why he was doing this, the Georgia Tech captain replied, I'm measuring you for a sandwich. <laughs> now is as good a time as any to introduce a major player in this story, John Heisman. He was the head coach of the Georgia Tech team and the main architect behind everything we are about to discuss. There are larger discussions to be had about him, his importance to the game of football, and his personality, but um, we're gonna try and leave those as much as we can for another day. The Georgia Tech team had their first and second squad of players alternate quarters. So squad A plays the first quarter, squad B plays the second, etc. Heisman told them that whichever set of players scored the most points would be treated to a steak dinner. <laughs> Pretty good motivation, right? After the, game was, after the game was over, it was decided that both squads deserved steak. <laughs> Along the way to Atlanta, Cumberland's train stopped in Nashville. The Cumberland coach decided to swing by Vanderbilt University to see if he could recruit some help. He didn't recruit anybody, but three Cumberland players, for some reason or another, were left behind. <laughs> the score at the end of the first quarter was 63 to zero. So far, I have referred <laughs> so far, I have referred to the Cumberland Bulldogs as a football team, but that doesn't tell the full story of this cursed collection of college students. Going into the 1916 season, Cumberland was forced to disband its football team due to budget, due to budget issues. It was left to student football manager George Allen to cancel all of the football team's scheduled appearances. He was able to cancel all of them 
except for one. Forced in between a rock and a hard place, he recruited a ragtag team of law students, fraternity brothers, and one local newspaper reporter <laughs> to take the trip to Georgia and meet their fates. Most of the Cumberland players hadn't played football before. <laughs> of those that had, none of them were any good. Uh, <laughs> The main exception to this was the reporter. <laughs> uh, sorry, I lost it. Uh, he played under a fake name of Johnny Dog Nelson. They had little, if any, practice beforehand. The plan was just do what they could and get out of there as unscathed as possible. <laughs> Given this group, it wasn't shocking to learn that the team was described as absolutely minus any apparent football virtues. At one point, a wild dog ran in from the stands and chased a Cumberland player off the field. <laughs> Cumberland didn't have a team. Why did they follow through with this? Even if Georgia Tech said they still wanted to play, Cumberland could have just not shown up. The answer to that is twofold. First, Georgia Tech offered to pay Cumberland to come to Atlanta and play them. In this case, to the tune of $500 plus expenses something that is still a common practice for top tier schools to this day, just for a lot more money. And along with the carrot came the stick. If Cumberland failed to honor the contract by not showing up, Heisman threatened to sue Cumberland for $3,000, about $67,000 in today's money. Cumberland could not afford to pay the $3,000 without risking a series of financial catastrophes that could have brought an end to the university. So Cumberland was essentially extorted by Heisman into playing this game. In 1936, shortly after his death, the trophy for the best player in college football was renamed the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> Given his players and experience, uh, Allen's plan for play calling was to assign each player a vegetable. Then at the, line of, at the line of scrimmage, a series of vegetables would be called to describe the play that Cumberland should run and who would get the ball. <laughs> Georgia Tech quickly found out which players corresponded to which vegetable. The score at halftime was 126 to zero. Like any good coach, Heisman gave his players a pep talk during halftime. During this speech, he tells his players, we're ahead for now, but you can't tell what these Cumberland players have up their sleeves, he said. So hit them clean, but hit them hard. Coach Allen, motivated by that sweet, sweet $500, was doing all he could given the circumstances. Obviously, the Cumberland players weren't as motivated. You can only get beat up so much for a share of 500 bucks. This led to several players creatively taking themselves out of the game. <laughs> At one point, Heisman found a Cumberland player hiding under a blanket on his sideline. <laughs> when noting the obvious that this player was on the wrong sideline, the Cumberland player, Cumberland player replied, I know, coach, but if I go back over there, that darn Coach Allen is going to put me back in. <laughs> George Allen went on to have a successful career in politics, befriending several presidents along the way. He wrote a book about his career called Presidents Who Have Known Me. <laughs> Please enjoy this face coming to a nightmare near you. <laughs> Given. The lopsided score. George Allen approached John Heisman to ask about, or given the circumstances, plead to end or shorten the game. Now, Heisman is a man who is simultaneously ice cold and also has no chill. <laughs> so he does agree to shorten the game. Instead of playing 15, more, 15 minute quarters, they'll play 12 minute quarters. <sighs> Looking for a spark. Cumberland decided to try something crazy. After one of Georgia Tech's many, many touchdowns, they decided to try and block the extra point attempt. It would be a small victory, and little did they know, also a Pyrrhic one. 
To stop the kick, they executed what is known as the climb the ladder play, where one player runs up the backs of his teammates to get that little bit of extra height to reach the ball. Vichy Woods volunteered his tribute to make the block. He successfully launched himself into the air and blocked the kick. Hey! Not with his hands, though, <laughs> but with his face. <laughs> it was reported that the sound of ball meeting face could be heard as far back as the 10th row of the stands. The score at the end of the third quarter was 180 to zero. <laughs> it's looking good. <laughs> During one of the many kickoffs to Cumberland, the ball was fumbled by a Cumberland player. As the ball rolled to his teammate, he shouted to his teammate to pick up the ball, to which the teammate replied, you dropped it, you pick it up. <laughs> so, to truly understand the motivation for this drubbing, we have to turn to another sport. Baseball. Yay. Hey, love this image. Uh, during the 19, that's a dove. Um, during the 1915 baseball season, <laughs> um, during the 1915 baseball season, these two universities played each other. It is rumored and assumed that Cumberland used a team of professional minor league players, posing as college students. Cumberland's ringers beat Georgia Tech that, in that game 22 to zero. The coach of that Georgia Tech baseball team, none other than John Heisman. Yeah. Before football, Heisman studied drama. When he wasn't coaching, Heisman would work as a Shakespearean actor. There was one play, one play, where Cumberland had a chance to score. Georgia Tech had somehow, some way, had, they had missed Johnny Dog Nelson. So he had the ball and nothing but open field in front of him. Johnny goes into a sprint, running for the end zone, and trips over a teammate, <laughs> crawling on the ground, looking for their glasses. <laughs> the game ends 222 to zero. Cumberland thoroughly and mercilessly, 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 whatever, they were destroyed. <laughs> there wasn't even enough space on the scoreboard to fit the final score. Heisman noted that his team had played a, quote, fairly good game. Uh, <laughs> Georgia's Tech Day was not over yet, though. As the players were split back into their first and second squads, then played a 30-minute scrimmage against each other. No chill. Um, <laughs> a local reporter that attended the game reflected on the whole affair thusly. It was not a football game, but as a burlesque, it was a very ludicrous and amusing pastime. In fact, it was such a good joke that very few of the spectators left until the last whistle blew. Everybody enjoyed it but the Lebanon athletes, and they didn't seem to have any idea what was going on at any stage of the melee. Some years after this game, but not specifically because of it, Cumberland formally ended its football program. The university has since revived its athletics programs under a new mascot, the Phoenix. <laughs> Given the experience of the 1916 Cumberland team, I can think of no better mascot. So, here's to the poor schmucks of the Cumberland team. All the things that happened to them, I haven't even told you. And to you, for joining me on this wild sports ball ride, May we all rise from the ashes of our absurd defeats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh man, that was rough. <laughs>
the poor dove. So, as you may have noticed, we have a charming Wolpertinger mascot. And we are building an Adventure Harvey map. Uh, so you can, if you adopt or win one of our charming Wolpertinger Adventure Companion Harveys, you can hashtag them Adventure Harvey or post them on our Something Weird group on Facebook so we can see where you've been. And where has Harvey been the last couple of, where has Harvey been? Harvey has admired art in Berlin. Harvey has admired sculpture in the Sculpture Garden in Minneapolis. And Harvey had a little me time lounging by the pool in Scottsdale. <laughs> so, as we're coming to an end of the first half, a reminder, we rely on your support to make this crazy show happen. So, during intermission, please find our merch table, wave merch table, where you'll find all kinds of amazing Wolpertinger swag, and you have a chance to adopt a uh, your own adventure, Harvey, to take on adventures. I make them. I believe they have all been adopted, but tonight's themed Harvey is Harvey the Marsupertinger, uh, a amazing platypus Wolpertinger adventure hybrid companion. So we will take a short cocktail break, and when we come back, there will be um, Victorians discovering that water plus tubes plus gravity equals fun. Uh, we'll find out the terrible decisions that Cal Caligula made, some of them on a boat. And uh, there will be more absurdist philosophy than you, you can shake a stick at, if you account that this metaphor, uh, there actually is no stick, and do sticks have inherent value, and what is the meaning? We will answer that after the break. See you in about 15.